I'm not your teacher, I'm your, your pre-teacher. I'm uh, making a quick announcement. Um, this is geared towards our parents uh, that have children sixth grade or, and under. Um, it has always been our practice that the teachers in those classes are supposed to keep the kids in the classroom till the parents come and pick them up. But if either side of that breaks down, then we have a problem. So we have reminded all of our teachers that they're supposed to do that, but then for them to be effective, the parents need to then go and pick up their children. So um, if our parents would shortly after the first bell start making their way back to their kids' classrooms, that would be appreciated because um, we want to protect all of our kids and we want to make that a practice that they aren't just turned loose, especially the two and three-year-olds and the four and five-year-olds because they're at that age that they're really fast, but they're not really thinking very well. So they, they may not end up in here. So anyway, but that is for all of our kids, sixth grade down. If you would please make it a practice to pick them up, we would appreciate that. And that's on Sunday night, Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Thank you. And now we've got our guest speaker this morning that's going to do us a great job. Oh, thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, as you're aware, Jared is not here today. He's uh, enjoying a vacation with his family, and uh, I've come to have a high regard for Jared. He does a great job with our kiddos, and it's an important job, and it's a challenging job, and, and he does a, does a great job with it. Uh, we're going to deviate also. He's been uh, leading in, in your discussion in the book, in the Thessalonian letters. And uh, we're going to deviate from that. And we're going to kind of play off the uh, prayer breakfast that we had yesterday morning. It had a, had a great turnout. It was a very uplifting experience. And we're going to uh, focus on the uh, title on the screen of Lord Teach Us to Pray. Uh, so let's begin with a, with a short prayer, and then we'll begin our discussion today. Our Father, we're grateful for another beautiful day and the opportunity to come together and to uh, open your word. We're thankful that you've revealed yourself to us through your word, and we uh, ask for open hearts and greater understanding because we realize that as we search your word, we strengthen our faith. Continue to give us the things that we need and help us always to have grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. There's an old saying that if you want to uh, do something well, want to know how to find to do something well, you ask an expert. For example, if you want to know how to invest in the stock market, you might call Warren Buffett. He might give you some advice. If you want to improve your golf game, you might talk to Richard Sutton. Uh, if he's not available, maybe uh, Tiger Wood might be. Uh, but if you want to improve your prayer life, Jesus is the person to, to, to visit with. He understood it. He believed it. He preached it. He practiced it. And so the disciples came to an expert with a very simple request. In Luke chapter 11, the first verse Luke says, one day when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he finished, one disciple said, Lord, teach us to pray. That could have a double meaning. Uh, maybe teach us how to pray, but I think that disciple is saying, Lord, teach us to pray. Just teach us to do it. Uh, we want to pray like you pray, with the frequency, with the fervor with the intensity, with the consistency that you pray. And so he's going to honor their request. He's going to teach them to pray. And he's going to do it in various ways. First of all, he taught them to pray by example. There are 26 references throughout the gospel recorded where Jesus is praying. And he prays in all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of situations, for all kinds of reasons. When he fed the 5,000, it was a long day. He'd been healing, he'd been teaching. He feeds the 5,000. He prayed over the food before he distributed it. Then afterwards, he sent the crowd away, and then he went into a mountain to pray. 
Mark 135 says, while it was still dark, he got up and went out to pray. Luke tells us that from time to time he would often slip away into an isolated place to pray. He prayed all night before selecting the 12 apostles. And who can forget that agonizing prayer in the garden on the night of his arrest that John records. So he, he taught them how to pray. They saw him pray. And that probably is what prompted their request of teach us to pray. We want to pray. We want to learn to pray like you pray. But he also taught them by precept. He gave them some do's and don'ts when you pray. First of all, he said, pray secretly. Now, he's not uh, condemning public prayer. But there are times when we need to go away by ourselves and pray. Uh, go, go somewhere where you're not distracted. Go somewhere where you're not interrupted. Go somewhere where you can focus. He said, go into your closet and pray. Uh, create an atmosphere, a place of prayer, a place of significant, special significance. For example, in Acts, 8, in Acts 16, Paul would normally go into a city. He would go to the synagogue. There he would find religious people who were already acquainted with some of the basic foundations. But when he goes into Philippi, there's no synagogue, which indicates that there's not a significant Jewish population there. But he did learn that there was a place of prayer. A group of women would go to the river, and they would pray. It was not a holy place, but it was a special place, a place where they could go, focus, concentrate and pray so he says pray secretly he also says pray sincerely sometimes we get into habits where we simply repeat meaningless repetition there's a difference between praying and saying a prayer you can say a prayer just repeating words to the point that they lose their meaning but pray from the heart, he said. Vain repetitions. Repeating the same words, the same phrases, over and over until they lose their meaning. Simply reciting empty words. So he says, pray sincerely. Pray from your heart. Uh, and then he says, pray specifically. Prayer is not for God's benefit. He, he doesn't need my prayers. Uh, prayer is for my benefit. When I pray, I'm reminded of my frailties, my shortcomings, my needs, my dependence. God doesn't need directing. Uh, he, he doesn't need reminding. Uh, he says, you have not. Why? Because you ask not. Uh, ask in faith, nothing wavering. Uh, he already knows what I need uh, before I even ask. And so when I pray specifically, I remind myself of my needs and my dependence. I remind myself of where my many blessings come from. And it gives me an opportunity to express gratitude for those blessings. So he prayed, or he taught them to pray by giving them an example repeatedly. He taught them to pray by giving them some do's and don'ts. Don't pray like that Pharisee did in the temple. Uh, he, he tells the story of the Pharisee and the publican who go into the temple to pray. The Pharisee uses that expression, uses that opportunity, as Pharisees often did, to make the prayer about themselves. God, you're really lucky to have me on your team. Uh, all these wonderful things I do, all these rules that I kept, uh, and the publican in the corner who will not even lift his eyes, uh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, so he says, 
the, the Pharisee is a good example of a bad example of, of praying. Uh, so pray, pray secretly, pray sincerely, and pray specifically. Now your, your questions and your comments are welcome. Uh, I've got a lot, lot to talk about up here, but you're, you're welcome to add in anything that, uh, that comes to your mind. Well, not, a, not anything, but... Uh. The, the third thing, the third uh, way he taught them to pray was to give them a model. He gave them a pattern. He gave them a template, as it were. We sometimes call this the Lord's Prayer. But not because he prayed it, but because he taught it. Uh, he didn't need to pray this prayer. He didn't need to ask for forgiveness. He didn't need to ask for direction. And it's easy for us, because we're so familiar with it, to recite these words without really grasping the meaning and the depth of what he's saying. It's not intended to be a rote prayer to be recited. Uh, what he's saying is, these are the kinds of things you need to include when you pray. You need to add praise. You need to add thanksgiving. You need to make requests. Uh, here's your pattern. Here's your model. But not word for word. Uh, so praise, adoration, request. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who is in heaven. Sometimes it's difficult for us to comprehend this being God. This uh, powerful, majestic, omnipotent, omnipresent spirit being. How do we as humans grasp that? He's unbounded by time. He's unbounded by space. We remind ourselves of his greatness. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the sun and the moon and the stars, why would you bother with us? But you do. Uh, and so to kind of get our arms around who, who this being is, we use metaphors. Comparisons. God is like. David said, God is like a shepherd. And David could understand that. He is a shepherd. And he knows the sheep, their, their literal survival depends on the shepherd. They, they can't make it by themselves. He gives them, he feeds them, he directs them, he guides them, he protects them, he, he nourishes them. He does all the things that they have to do that they can't do for themselves. Sheep have no sense of direction. And folks, neither do we. Uh, it is not in man to direct his own steps. And we know that in our heads. We don't always practice that in our lives. Uh, and so, God is like a shepherd. Maybe we can kind of relate to that. But when Jesus used one example of what God is like, he said, God is like a loving father, which he calls, which he uses here. The example is Luke 15, the parable of the uh, prodigal son and that loving father who welcomes that uh, prodigal son back home. And so Jesus referred to God as father, and he directed us when we pray to do the same thing. He, here he tells them to address them as our Father. The word there is the word Abba, A-B-B-A. -B -B -A. It's a term of uh, endearment. Uh, it's symbolic of love, of acceptance. It suggests God is a provider. He's a protector. He, wants, he is one who administers discipline, guidance, nurture. Uh, you know, I, I never 
referred to my dad as father. A, father, a, a formal term like, my, my kids don't call me father. They call me dear old dad. Uh, and it's a term of endearment. And that's the term that Jesus uses here. Uh, and he's in heaven. Not in a specific place. That term suggests he surrounds us. He's everywhere. He's, he's all over. He's in the heavens. Uh, when we have needs, he meets them. When we're hurting, as a loving father would do, he gives us comfort and relief. Doesn't keep score. No resentment. No saying, don't bother me with that. In fact, he instructs us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known. Everything. Nothing is too big. Nothing is too small. Uh, when I'm hurting, when I'm criticized unjustly, when I'm injured, when I'm afraid, when I'm happy, we have a Father to comfort us, to hold us till it gets better, to deal with our hurt. He has unlimited resources that he's more than willing to share. And we know, as Paul said, he can and he will do abundantly more than we ask or think. My God shall supply all your needs uh, because he's a loving father. David said, because he's my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, any thoughts, comments? Give you a chance to talk. Last chance. Hallowed be your name. It's a term of adoration. Consecration. A name to be revered. This says, folks, when you pray, be aware of who you're talking to. This is, this is not something that you take lightly. Uh, it's a statement of fact rather than request. It's an acknowledgement that his name is holy. It's unlimited power, majesty, love, resources. When you say these two things here, and it maybe not register with us every time, but you're saying and rec recognizing and acknowledging, I've got a standing appointment with the creator of the universe. Well, that's a staggering thought. Uh, staggering thought. You know, a while ago when I mentioned Warren Buffett and, and Tiger Woods, the chances of you sitting down with them across the table are pretty remote. But to think that you have a standing appointment with the creator of the universe. Anytime, anywhere, any place, he's there. Uh, your thoughts on that? Yes, sir. Everywhere. Okay, Mike's got a got a mic back there. Mike, Mike with a mic. Uh, okay, he's everywhere. Uh, you know, Don, Don Martin made that made that comment. You, you're never away from the presence of God, no matter where where you are. You never escape His presence. And our Father, who is in in the heavens surrounding us everywhere all over he's got your mic right there oh want me to have the mic? <laughs> uh, let's see my my children that we raised never called me father either right they always called me dad or daddy 
Yeah. Uh, and I know it says in the Holy Scriptures there in Matthew 7, call no man father upon the earth, which I know the faith of the Catholic faith. Sure. They call their uh, priest father. Right. And uh, yeah, that should not be. Should not be. Okay. Good, good comment. Lord, teach us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, expand your kingdom. It's here. But pray that it will be expanded. Pray that it will be found in places where it doesn't exist yet. Pray that it will grow. Pray that it will grow in my heart. The rule of God is what this term kingdom suggests and implies. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's an old country western song that says, thank God for unanswered prayers. Uh, and the, the gist of it was this guy went back to his high school reunion 25, 30 years later. And this girl that he was so in love with in high school that he thought he couldn't live without, and she broke his heart. And when he went back, she had changed. Not in good ways. And he said, I, God knew what he was talking about when he said, you don't want her. Uh, and the same thing happened. How, how often have you prayed for something and it didn't happen? And then time passes and you say, thank God for unanswered prayers. I'm glad he didn't give me that. Uh, we've got an example. <clears throat> the road to Emmaus got these two travelers who are returning home after the crucifixion. They're traumatized by events that they have uh, witnessed over the weekend. They had put great hope in their future in Jesus, and now he's gone. We had hoped that he would free Israel from the Roman oppression. What God had done was free mankind from sin and death, and they're concerned about politics. We had hoped is often followed by words of disappointment. What I wanted didn't come. What came I didn't want. Our prayers are often short-sighted. Your will be done. What if God had honored the prayers of those Jews who wanted a military conqueror setting up a king, an earthly kingdom? Uh, good thing he didn't answer that prayer. You know, a, a long car trip can kind of... Uh, uh, teach us about how God deals with us. When our girls were small, we'd, we'd travel to visit Cheryl's parents. It's about a seven-hour drive. And that's kind of comparable to God transporting us from home to heaven. Uh, both demand patience, a sense of direction, a driver who knows the destination, understands the trials of travel, uh, the worth of reward when you get there. And occasionally, only occasionally, probably didn't happen with you, but a conflict would arise between the passengers and the driver. Because uh, children have no concept of time or distance. And so they would oftentimes make requests. And I couldn't honor all the requests. We couldn't stop at every McDonald's. Uh, we, we couldn't stop at that amusement park that looked like a lot of fun because they lost sight of the destination. If, if we honored every time they wanted to stop, we'd, we'd never get there. God's desire for us is to reach heaven. The itinerary will include some stops. It'll include some diversions to kind of encourage the journey. But he frowns on stops that will deter or impede our arrival at our destination. When his will and my will, my desires collide, I need to remind myself of who the driver is. He's more concerned with my safe arrival at that destination than with my immediate desires. Those requests are not always evil. They're, they're not unfair. They're not rebellious. They're just unnecessary and they're ill-advised. Uh, but they're just not in my best interest. Passenger may disagree, 
you know, that new job, that new house, that promotion would be ind indispensable to my happiness. God knows otherwise. And he says, no, let's go a few more miles. Uh, there's some better options down the road. His thoughts are not my thoughts. As the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. It's important that I trust that. Your will be done. My prayer should be not that my will be done in heaven, but your will be done on earth. Uh, and I should be an instrument in accomplishing that. Okay, any, any thoughts about that? We've got to move along here. Okay, we move from uh, God's heavenly per personage and his holy name to daily, daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. This, this may be hard for us to grasp in our land of plenty. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, emphasis here on spiritual things, but our physical needs are important as well. And Jesus said you need to include that in your prayers. God is concerned with what, what we need to sustain our physical life. Uh, the same one who clothes us in righteousness always close our, also closes, close our bodies. Uh, our eternal salvation and our evening meal comes from the same source. This term bread represents everything we need to sustain and preserve our physical life. And we need to talk to God about our necessities of life. He promised that he will provide for our needs, but it, it really is difficult for us to pray this. Remember, uh, we had a, at our previous place of worship, we had a, a gentleman from a, a, a children's home who related this story. They, they got a, a new little girl uh, who came to live there, and she had been bounced around to various foster, foster homes, and they brought her to this, to this place to provide some stability for her, and so they would inspect the, the kids' rooms periodically. They lived in cottages. They came to her room, and she had a jar of peanut butter in there. And they said, well, you don't need to keep food in here. That's not a good idea. Uh, there's, there's a kitchen right in there. You get whatever you want. So they took her peanut butter. They came back the next time to inspect. She got a jar of peanut butter in the room. Well, why are you keeping peanut butter in here? She said, well, when y'all kick me out of here, at least I'll have something to eat. Uh, what a sad story. Her instability. But we don't, we don't worry about that. Our refrigerators are full. Our pantries are full. And to say our daily bread... Do you worry about your daily bread? You know, I've never missed a meal in my short life. Uh, but there are those who do worry about that. Talk to God about, you know, we got grocery stores, shelves are full, four grocery stores within 15 minutes of our house. They've got everything we need or want. And so to, to, to pray for our daily bread is kind of hard for us to grasp. But there are a lot of folks. That's not the case. But I need to remind myself of where that daily bread comes from. The process of how it gets to my pantry. Uh, but when I pray for daily bread, it reminds us of how we get our daily bread. It's a declaration of dependence. It acknowledges God as a provider, as a source of our daily bread. Uh, and it's important that we acknowledge and recognize that. Forgive us our sins. You know, this is a this is a great concept. As we for, you know, we realize and we and we repeat this in order to receive forgiveness, we've got to extend forgiveness. things that we as Christians are called on to do. To genuinely forgive those who have hurt us. Easy to voice why, why it's important. It's a noble, noble gesture and it's great 
until I have to do it. Uh, then, then that's another matter. Easy to say it, not quite so easy to do it. Uh, forgive. Uh, Jesus' comment from the cross. Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive Peter with his three denials. You may be familiar with this lady, Corey Tim Boone. She uh, lived in Amsterdam, and as World War II breaks out, Two breaks out. Uh, she and her family were touched by the uh, assault of the Nazis on the Jewish population. She's not Jewish. Her family's not. But they had compassion and determined to do what they could do in order to uh, uh, rescue as many of these people as they could. They built a kind of a secret room in their house and over a period of time are credited with probably rescuing about 800 individuals, getting them out of the country to a safe place. But they got caught. And Miss Boone and her sister and her father were shipped off to concentration camps. Father went to Auschwitz. She and her sister went to an all-female camp called Ravensburg, it's in northern Germany. By 1945, about 50,000 women had been housed in that camp. Her father and her sister died in the camps. She survived. And in the years after the war, she became, for lack of a better term, kind of a, uh, oh, an, an inspirational speaker. She's telling her story uh, to various groups. And she would always include in her presentation the importance of forgiveness. How important it is to forgive those no matter how badly they had treated you. One night after speaking to a group, the audience was coming by and complimenting her for, for her comments. And then she saw coming from the back kind of a heavyset man, balding, and she immediately recognized who he was. He was one of the guards in that camp where she was. And he made his way up to where she was. And he said, I certainly enjoyed your comments. And I noticed in your comments you mentioned Ravensbrook. I was a guard in that camp. I did terrible things to people. But now I'm a Christian, and I've repented of those things. And I know God has forgiven me, but I need someone in that camp who suffered because of my behavior to forgive me. And he stuck out his hand. Will you forgive me? What do you do? She said, memories of that camp just kind of flooded over me. And my hand wouldn't move. But I whispered a short prayer, God help me, help me forgive this man. And she did. Her hand came up, and she said, of course, I forgive you, my brother. And she said, an immediate peace kind of overwhelmed me. I had to do what I had been telling others that they must do. Not easy. Wasn't condoning his behavior. But I had to forgive him. This next to the last phrase in the camp, don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This seems kind of contradictory. Because James said, let no one say when he is tempted, God has tempted me. God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. 
So why would you pray to God, don't deliver, don't, don't, uh, deliver, don't, whatever I'm trying to say here, don't, don't lead us into temptation. Don't lead us into temptation. Well, he seems to be saying here, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. But there's another way, I think, maybe to look at this. Some of you from my generation may remember this guy. Jim Marshall. Had a long 19-year career with the Minnesota Vikings. An outstanding defensive lineman. But he's remembered for one play. Happened in, a, in an October Sunday in Kansas City. Kansas City runner fumbled the ball. Jim Marshall grabbed it up. Raced down the field, 66 yards. Crossed the goal line, flipped the ball out of the end of the end zone, turned around, waited for his teammates to come and congratulate him and celebrate with him. The only people who came down were some Kansas City Chiefs because he had run 66 yards the wrong way. And he had, he had crossed his own goal line rather than theirs. And by flipping the ball out of the end zone, that's a safety. That's two points for their team. Wrong way, Jim Marshall. So, God, help me not to be Jim Marshall. Help me not to go the wrong direction. Uh, not, it wasn't intentional. It wasn't deliberate. In fact, he took a lot of... The, the, the Vikings won the game in spite of his uh, mess up. And they, they, of course, they ribbed him all the way home. They were in the airplane. And one, one guy suggested, let Marshall drive, drive the plane because we'll wind up in Hawaii rather than Minneapolis. Uh, but don't let me be Jim Marshall. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a dad and a child walking down a sidewalk that's icy. And dad warns him, be careful. He might fall here. The boy being the boy, takes off, slides on the ice, feet go up, bottom goes down, and Dad said, told you, God help me to heed warnings, hold my hand, lead me through those difficult places, those slippery spots, uh, guide me, direct me, help me, don't help me avoid those temptations. Uh, rather than plowing ahead with my own devices and direction. And remember, folks, all temptation is not limited to an enticement to do evil. A lot of temptations in involve other things. Discouragement, doubt, self-sufficiency, arrogance, pride, uh, Father, help me avoid those temptations as well. Okay, any any comments or thoughts? Yes, sir. <laughs> That's your problem. <laughs> right. Sit over here and oh, thank you. Paul, in uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, I urge that entreaties, prayers, and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. In that prayer in Luke 11, he covers all of those. He does. He absolutely uh, does. Thanksgiving for what we have, petitioning on somebody else's behalf, entreating God to make sure we don't end up in, in some kind of terrible situation of temptation, whatever, but... sure. Covers all three. Get rid of that name. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. He says, he says, uh, oh, you got it. Okay. Yeah, I got it. They, they gave it to me. Uh, you'll have to be careful. Marshall might arrest you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. He says, another point, he says, just this is something you should do consistently. Should you be just part of Do you have something else? I did, yeah, but go ahead. Go ahead, I'll wait. Okay. Ask. For consistency in this. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on finding. Yeah. Keep on knocking. This is, this is something that goes on continually and consistently, not a, not a one-time thing. Okay, Ed? 
I don't know a thing about football. Okay. I'm one of the few men that never watch football. I've often told people, they say, well, what do you know about it? I says, I do know this. If I would go down on the field, I'd probably go the wrong way with the ball. Right. But other than that, I don't know a thing about it. <laughs> right. But when I was a young boy, a young man, young teenager, maybe even an older teenager, I got really absorbed into baseball with the uh -huh. Pittsburgh Pirates. And gosh, I got so absorbed that I found when I became a Christian, I was baptized into the Lord that I had to sh shed it because it was absorbing my life. Sure. It became more than what God became. Right. So I had to give up on sports altogether. I still think that's a major temptation for me, right. anyway, to become too absorbed into sports. You sure. A, a so problem I became with a, a religious fanatic instead. Yeah. Okay, a few quick thoughts about some prayer. Number one, when I pray, it makes me aware that I'm in the presence of God. We need to avoid confusing God with Santa Claus. Handing him a list and say, I've been good, I deserve all these gifts and all these blessings. I've done a few minor things, but they don't count. Uh, and and the, the fallacy of trying to manipulate God. Prayer takes many forms. It can express sorrow, joy, frustration, help, thanksgiving. Let your request be known in all things by prayer and supplication. Can, can deal with many, many topics and many ideas and many issues. And, and as Marshall said, it, it contains praise, requests for physical and spiritual needs, forgiveness, guidance, direction, all of those things. Prayer is always available, uh, no matter, anywhere, anytime. Jesus prayed early in the morning, late in the evening. Decision time, Paul said, I give thanks always for you. Puts us in touch with other people. Uh, gives us an opportunity to express our gratitude, uh, source of our blessings. Uh, not that we're entitled to these good things just because we're good people. We're, we're given these things because of who God is, not because we deserve them. Puts us in touch with other people. That prayer group yesterday that we had was, uh, was uplifting, and we prayed for each other, and we prayed for all kinds of things. Our Father, give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. The early Christians prayed for each other. That's one of the ways that they were able to bear one another's burdens and to weep together. Rejoice together. Uh, prayer has limitations. You know, our culture says you can do anything you put your mind to. Well, we can't. We obviously have limitations of things we can't do. We have no control over our health, uh, the forgiveness from others, the weather, the disease, uh, how other people behave. Uh, but we pray for God's intervention. And prayer says... I am important in God's sight. God thinks I matter. And He invites me to approach Him with my needs, with my cares, with my concerns. He says, cast your cares on me, for I care for you. It's a reminder of the price that He paid for me, of the promises that He extends to me, and the prize that awaits me. Lord, teach us to pray. Any last minute comments? Okay, I think we're done. Thank you for your attention. Sure.